know, the main thing we're going to talk about is how we get from our, our uh, increasingly pregnant mares that we've got at home um, to what we want is a, is a nice live mare, happy foal. And so if we go back to where we started last year, this was the point at which we sort of uh, acknowledged we've got a pregnancy. And that leads on to, well, when are our, our mares actually due? The average number gestation length of a mare is 342 days, so around about your 11 months. Um, but they don't all read textbook. Quite happily, they'll go a month overdue. Um, foal doesn't get any bigger. Um, the the uh, usually if they if they're going overdue, it's just because the foal's not quite cooked yet, and it just needs to stay in there. We don't induce them. Um, usually, the foal isn't very viable if we do try and induce them, and, and it creates all sorts of problems. So we just allow them to go to the date that they actually want to foal on. If they come early, that's not usually great news. Um, if it's before 320 days, so about three weeks early, then they tend to have a fairly poor prognosis. <coughs> so our uh, infall mare, um, what do we need to be doing with her right now? Uh, ideally, we want to give her blue and tetanus booster, but six to eight weeks before she falls so that she's got maximum amount of antibodies on board so that she then passes those onto the foal in her, her colostrum and when she falls. <coughs> um, topic that, that perhaps is a little bit too big to go into this evening, but equine herpes vaccination, which is obviously being talked about a lot right now. Um, not necessarily because there's a lot more of it about, but just because people are a lot more aware of it. And whilst it's, it's difficult to get too excited about the um, uh, herpes virus, it is quite relevant to our pregnant mares. So um, the main thing is, is keeping any, any snotty viral young horses away from your late-term pregnant mares because it does cause abortion in late-term pregnant mares. And you can vaccinate against it if you're worried about your, your mare, if, if there's a lot of other young horses on the, on the yard that have a lot of viruses um, uh, or horses that are moving around a lot, either keep your mare away from those or we can vaccinate them in, in late gestation. <coughs> um, you can maintain your, your normal worming routine. A um, couple of weeks before the expected bowling date, we want to get her to her location where she's going to bowl so that she can just get into the routine of, of where she is so that she's happy and comfortable. If that means coming in at night, then, then we start bringing her in at night early so that she's happy and comfortable with that. If it's a new location, if she's, sort of, for example, coming to some park to, to bowl um, or going to another stud to bowl, then we just want to get them there. So they've got a little bit of settling in period. Um, and if they had a caslex, which is what we do um, with mares with a slightly sort of saggy vulva that we need to just tighten up in, and tidy up. When we put them in foal, their vulva remains stitched throughout that pregnancy to stop them from, from uh, sucking air and, and any debris into the, into the vagina. And that just needs to be opened up before they foal. Um, once they start to look fairly imminent, we'll, uh, we'll open them up, and that's sort of a mare on the left here that you can see as being stitched up the, the previous season, so her vulval opening only sort of goes halfway up, and this top part has been uh, closed up, and we just open it up. It's much neater and tidier if we do it than if the fold does it. <coughs> What do we need to do? What do we need to get ready and have ready um, for, for uh, in order to prepare for foley arriving? We best to, to have them in, indoors at, at night um, in a large, deeply bedded box. 
um, is, is required so that they've got plenty of room so that if you imagine Mare flat out that there's plenty of room around her for the foal to actually come out and not get, get <coughs> squashed. Um, tail bandage ready to put on her tail when she's firmly imminent and, and we think she's about to fold. Keep her keep tail out of the way, keep it all neat and tidy. A few phone numbers just to have on hand in case of emergency. Seems quite logical, but... but come in. Um, but just making sure they're actually in your phone, phone rather than having to sort of phone around to, to get them. So you, your vet's number. Really quite useful, a local farmer's number in that in, in the event of, of a uh, potential sort of problem, they're really good at obstetrical stuff because they're used to uh, carving cows and, and lamb and sheep um, and they're much more likely to be there quicker than we are if we're not particularly uh, close to, <coughs> to your yard. Um, and they can be really helpful people. And, and they've got a bit of muscle power as well, just in case required. And, and likewise, just having another pair of hands available, somebody that you can call in the eventuality that you need an extra pair of hands, um, it's really useful. So, a bit of loo, quite helpful. A little pot to um, put some colostrum in, so your colostrum is your first milk that the uh, mare produces. If you can collect a little bit of colostrum straight after she's foaled, before the, the, um, uh, before the foal sucks, then we can actually test that colostrum to see whether it's decent stuff or not. Um, once foal sucked, they, they've taken the really good stuff, so, so if we test it after that, we're never quite sure how good the initial bit was. Um, and likewise, having an idea of, of what, what plan you have in place if the mare doesn't have any milk, doesn't have any colostrum, runs milk, all the colostrums run out, um, and so either um, there are nice people like Debbie Temple here who keep a little bit in their freezer from stuff that they, they've stolen from another mare um, that's had loads of colostrum, um, and then you can get uh, commercial products such as um, the product that Alvar produced, which is made from mare plasma. So it's got all the antibodies um, from the mare plasma, um, and it's something that we can keep in our food, our food in the practice. Um, and then other other bits and pieces, fairly obvious, sort of clean towels and a, and a torch, bucket for your for your presenter to put it in after after the mare's fold. A um, little bit of piggy scrub for popping on the navel afterwards. Um, and then the other thing just to bear in mind is having some transport so that if there is a bit of a catastrophe, that your trainer's ready, you've got your trainer keys at the yard, it's all ready to go and, and there's there's no problems with no fuel in the in the lorry, etc. That that you literally can just put the mare in and go if needs be. Um, so, what's she going to look like when she's actually ready? Because you don't want to be looking at her every night for a month if she's really going to be a month overdue. Um, the first thing to, to develop is her udder, and in the last sort of three weeks, sh her udder will start to develop. Um, the changes around the tail head are usually next, and if you can see with this mare here, um, through the mud, um, <laughs> that she's just, can you see how she's a little bit sunken here? And if you palpate, if you sort of just prod her either side of that, of that tail head, just either side of the dock, that's all going really squidgy and really nice and soft, much softer than, than, uh, than your normal mare. Um, and that's all those ligaments just slackening off, ready to allow the foal to actually come out. And if you look at the pictures of her, vulva here, the vulva's just got quite stretched and elongated um, and so that will be in a sort of couple of weeks before she folds um, and then when the, uh, when the fold's more imminent uh, the mare will start to wax up um, and certainly I always sort of uh, as a student, oh, how, how would you tell whether it's waxing up but it, it's all fairly common sense stuff so so first milk is really thick, creamy colostrum, 
And so if you imagine a bit of dried cream on the end of, of her teats, that's exactly what it is. And it, it's a little bit out of focus, but it's Mare's just waxed up and she's literally just got a little droplet of, of dried wax on the end. Um, and you can sort of make out it's a little bit blurry. <coughs> but she's just got a few little waxy sort of splashes down her leg where literally just bits of milk are just leaking out of the uh, other every now and again. Um, so she's developed a bit of, got a bit of mammary development, she's slackened off, maybe she started waxing up, she's at, at her location, she's going to fall in, she's in a nice uh, deep bed in a, in a big box, this is um, one of the folding boxes um, here. Um, we don't really want to constantly sort of keep popping in and, and watching them there uh, because they're very good at, at controlling when they're going to have the, the fold. They can control things for up to like 48 hours. It, it's, it's quite spectacular and if they keep being bothered, they won't fold. Um, and they'll certainly wait till you're having a cup of tea. So, so um, CCTV itself is it's not that expensive, it's really, really useful. It means you can drink your cup of tea and watch the proceedings rather than keep popping out. And the mare's much happier that she's not being uh, disturbed. Um, and then the other thing that's, that's really quite useful is um, the foal alarms. There's various different foal alarms. Um, the ones that we use here are these ones that is set on a roller. And each time this mare lies on its side, flat out, for a certain period of time, the alarm will go off. So some people don't like them because you get a lot of false alarms. But for example, Debbie can turn over, look at the CCTV, know the mare's fine, go back to sleep. That's all fine. But if actually you then have to go out and, and check them, it's, they, they do become a little bit frustrating. Um, there's, there's also ones that go on the head collar as well. Um, and you can get ones that, hello um, <laughs> uh, you can get ones that are set off by sweat and, and temperature, so as the, as the mare gets more hot and bothered, they go off. Um, the, probably the best ones are the ones that you can actually stitch into the vulva. You can see here that you can imagine that as the uh, uh, fold comes to the vulva lips, then that actually bursts apart. You can even have that wide up so it sends you a text message. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be careful out about the mare's folding. But obviously, if there's a problem and your mare's trying to fold and the fold can't come out, then it, it's not going to set it off. So, so none of them are perfect, but it's certainly useful to have something on there. Um, and most mares are going to fold between around about 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. because that's usually when there's the least amount of activity around. Um, the stables and uh, so they they don't all read the textbook. This is sort of the textbook mare that we're describing, and by by no stretch of the imagination that they, they all read the textbook. But it, we'll we'll talk about the textbook now. Um, so they'll often give you a little bit of an indication that tonight's the night, in that they uh, perhaps don't eat their dinner, <coughs> not very interested in their hay, uh, start to get a little bit restless, getting up and down, maybe just start to get a little bit clammy, um, peeing and pooing a little bit more frequently. Um, and then that will just gradually build to sort of low-grade colic type signs. So, so looking at their tummy, um, maybe rolling, maybe pouring the ground. Um, and this is basically the uh, mare showing a little bit of discomfort as the foal wriggling round, and also it's the, the mare trying to assist the foal to do its wriggling round because it's got to get into its new position. Um, and the, the uterus starts to, to contract, the cervix starts to, uh, to relax, um, and at this point, what we want to do with these mares is, is pop your tail bandage on, get all of the loose hair and, and sort of uh, fold it up so that all of the tail is in, involved in the tail bandage so it's all out of the way and, and the fold's not going to get tangled up in it. 
little wash of, of uh, all, uh, all the girls' bits so that it's all nice and clean and hygienic. And normally this will go on for about an hour, but if you keep disturbing it, it'll go on for longer, um, and some of them will, will get on with the job a little bit more quickly. And the end point of, of what we term as first stage labour is the water breaking. So if we, I, I think it's helpful to know what's actually going on inside so that we can start to get our head around sort of, uh, what's happening. So when this is, this is very young foal, so we're looking at sort of 60 days or so here, um, and this is, they normally always lie in the same position, so, so uh, head towards the pelvis, legs up in the air, lying on the bottom of the abdomen. Um, so once we are trying to fold, then the, the fold has to then turn itself over because it's on its back and it needs to be on its front. Um, and it needs to get its front legs, these front legs out, stretch, get its head out stretched and get into the diving position that we've uh, got at the bottom here in order to be sort of correct and normal and, and come out as it should do. Um, and again, just so that we can understand what's going on, I think, not very nice pictures, but I think it's really important to just understand where the fold is sitting and what's surrounding it, so that when we see different bits of placenta appear that are right or wrong, we, can, we know whether they're right or wrong, because we understand sort of the layering effect. So, if we look at just the, um, if we look at the uh, diagram here, we've got the fold in the middle, okay, and uh, that's surrounded by its amniotic fluid, and the amniotic fluid is just the nice sort of stuff that it just lives in, nice friendly fluid, and it's surrounded by um, the very thin membrane of its um, amniotic bag which is just fairly translucent and you can see it surrounding the fold here. It's almost sort of slightly bluey and that fold's still got all of its uh, amniotic fluid inside the amniotic bag. Now, outside of that amniotic bag, we've got allantoic fluid, which is all the waste products that the fold's been producing, um, the ones that haven't been sent back to the mare, um, all the waste products produced during the pregnancy, um, and then on the outside of that, we have the actual placenta proper, the, the, what we call the uh, alantocorian, which is the uh, red furry bit that we can see here that actually attaches to the inside of the uterus and you've got all your uh, exchange of, of uh, oxygen and nutrients with, with the mare through that. Um, and then uterus around the outside of that. So, so with this, uh, this is the entire uterus that's been taken out of, uh, of a mare. Um, and then just gradually we peel back. This is the inside of the uterus wall, which is all furry and velvety. And basically it's, it's uh, like Velcro and the Velcro attachment to, this is the actual placenta. So that's Velcro stuck together for all of the transfer of the nutrients the fold side of that placenta is all quite smooth, and then we've got the, the uh, allantoic fluid, uranium, and, and fold inside. Um, so, that then helps us to understand we've got the uh, fold in its normal position, and what should happen is the, the red velvety surface if you can see here, the fold has broken a hole in it, okay, at, in order to be able to come out, and the actual red velvety surface of the, the uh, proper placenta is all still attached while the fold is, is, is coming out. Um, and therefore, <coughs> what you see come out is the amnion, um, and everything else is still attached. This is just showing the your normal position of, of your fold, where you should have two legs, 
one, one just in front of the other, and then uh, head should just be resting up on those knees, um, and that's a nice normal position. <coughs> so, uh, second stage labour starts when uh, the, you, your waters are broken, which is releasing the allanteric fluid, so all the waste product fluids, and that uh, bluish, whitish uh, amniotic sac appears at the vulval lips. Um, and then what should happen is that the folds should <coughs> rapidly appear after your waters are broken. Um, the mare will often be, lateral recumbency is lying on her side, uh, but some of them will stand up throughout the whole thing. Um, and just drop folds on a great height. Um, <laughs> uh, and the second stage labour is uh, sort of ends with, with full delivery of the fold. And this should take, on average, around about 20 minutes. So it's a pretty quick uh, process. It's all very explosive, much more so than the cows and the sheep that will take half the day to, to produce. Um, these guys, it, it, it's a very quick explosive process. Um, some of them will, will be much quicker, some of them will take, take considerably longer. Um, and whilst they're folding, each abdominal contraction can be sort of between 15 seconds and, and 60 seconds long. Um, and usually you'll have a few in a row and then they'll rest for a few minutes. As the, the folds actually up in the, in the birthing canal up in the pelvis, those contractions start to go much more quickly until they've actually got, got the, uh, the pelvis of the foal delivered and then they'll just stop for a while and rest. The back legs might still be in the mare um, but, the, uh, but the rest of it's come out and so the mare just takes a bit of a breather. Um, and usually the foal's front legs um, will break through the um, amniotic sac and so once it's sort of dived its way out head will be clear and, and the uh, amniotic sac will be sitting around it but if it hasn't done that then we can just break that open and we want to clear it away from, from uh, nose and mouth as quickly as we can once that chest is out so that as and when they breathe they're breathing air rather than sac into and just sort of <coughs> their, their nose occluded. Um, I don't know how clear these really are, but, but this is just a, a fairly normal process of uh, we've got uh, a little bit of amniotic uh, sac poking through, followed by a couple of legs, mare flat out, pushing away, and then once the foal is most of the way out but the legs are still in, she sits up, has a bit of a breather, and then gradually the foal sort of starts to have a bit of a wriggle and a shake and, and works its way round to, uh, to the front of the mouth. Um, and cord, no need to get too stressed about this. It usually does its own thing, either when mum gets up and wanders round or when foal gets up and wanders round, one or either of them will break that cord. Um, and so certainly don't worry about it. Um, there's thinking that actually there's up to a litre of blood in, in the cord, so if it's left intact for a little while, that's not a problem because it actually allows a little bit longer for that blood to be transferred into the foal. Um, so just leave them to, to sort it out themselves. Um, <coughs> and then the big question of when is it not going quite right and when do we need to get involved and just check whether things are going to plan or not. Um, and so these are sort of a few basic rules of thumb of uh, if her waters are broken and she's not really pushing very well, then let's go and have a little feel and see what's happening. Um, again, if there's just no progress 15 minutes after her, her waters are broken, then we want to know why we haven't got to sort of feet and a nose at that vulva. Um, and what, why is it not coming out? If at the vulva, you can only see 
a head and no legs, or a head and one leg, or no head at all and two legs, that, that's not great. Um, and you want to go and have a feel and just see <coughs> whether they're just sort of not quite aligned and, and we can perhaps do something about it, or whether actually there's just no head at all, it's, it's been left behind somewhere and, and we really have a bit of a situation. Um, we're going to go on to talk about this in the second half, but um, if a red bag appears, that's because if we go back to our placenta and that the fold should have dived its way through the uh, red bag initially that all stays intact and stays attached to the <coughs> lining of the uterus, if everything is detached already, the entire placenta is detached already, and as the fold's getting pushed out, it's getting pushed out with it, so it doesn't make a hole in it, then we need to do something about it because that, that fold is no longer getting any, any uh, oxygen through, through its placenta because it's all detached. And, and so that, that becomes an emergency. But it's fairly easy to deal with, and we'll, we'll go on and talk about that in the next, uh, the next bit. <coughs> um, if a leg pops out of the mare's amus, again, needs to be dealt with um, and does happen uh, and uh, if the foal has still got that amniotic sac over nostrils we want to jump in there and, and do something about it um, and so if you if this sort of situation arises then give us a call we're at the end of the phone you can put us on speakerphone alongside mayor and we can chat you through what you need to do and at, mean, in, at the same time we'll be sort of getting on our way if we feel that you've, you've got a problem that we need to come and help you with. Um, and what do you do when you do get involved? Do you want to go and have a little feel, see whether we've got head, two legs? If we have, a little bit of gentle traction as, she could, as the mare starts to uh, uh, have a uterine contraction, you can just help bit of gentle traction along at the same time as her contractions just to give her a bit of a helping hand um, <coughs> providing we've not got any sort of major sort of head and leg in the wrong position in their scenarios um, and again this is where your, your local farmer can be really helpful because because the sort of minor mouth presentations he, he'll be really good at helping you with and, and a bit of He'll give you a bit of confidence to, to have a pull and, and have a go. But we do just have to remind farmers that these aren't cows. <laughs> and carving jacks aren't appropriate. And that they can't finish their dinner and then come and help you. And, and they are horses and not cows. Um, so, uh, so, yes, they're very useful, but just have to be, remind, be reminded of these things. Um, <coughs> <coughs> so once you're happy that the foal is breathing well and uh, sort of happy with mare and foal, then leave them well alone. Um, you want to sort of discreetly observe them to make sure there's no problems arising, um, but you want to leave them to just develop a, a nice bond. And especially with maiden mares who are pretty freaked out by the situation, you want to leave them to, to develop sort of a pretty good bond before you go and, and do anything else in there. Um, once they are, once you are happy that they're, they're pretty well bonded, um, you, can, you can go in there, you can dip foley's uh, navel with, with your hippie scrub or iodine, um, and if foal hasn't, hasn't yet drunk, maybe uh, give a little helping hand, and that'd be a good opportunity to take a bit of colostrum for us to test when we come and do the work. Uh, mare and foal check. Um, and then uh, the mare will often just lie quite quietly um, during this period uh, for sort of about an hour. Um, towards the end of that hour, she's going to get a little bit colicky, a little bit restless. She's still not past her placenta, it's all, just all still attached to her uterus and the uterus just starts to contract again and she'll pass her uh, placenta as well. Um, big variation in when they do this. Generally, 
we want them to have done it within sort of a three hour window. Um, if they hold on to it for longer than that, then it can cause problems. And again, we'll go on to talk about that uh, uh, later on. Um, once you pass the placenta, then we want you to keep that, pop it in a bucket. And again, we want to have a look at that when we come and uh, uh, see the mayor. We want to make sure that it's all present and complete and we've got all the bits from, uh, from each of the wards and nothing's left behind. And that's, that's what we should have. This bit's usually been torn by the mare. We're not very interested in that bit. It's not stuck to anything, so usually it's all, all come out. Um, this is quite normal. It's a very rubbery sort of uh, object that often comes out. It's called a hippomane, um, and it's basically been created by secretions from the foal during, during pregnancy. It's very random. Um, and then this is the bit that we're much more interested in. This is the, the hole that the foal's made when it's dived out. Um, what we call the cervical scar, because that's the bit that sit, sat at the cervix. And then these are the two horns, so we've got a Y-shaped uterus. And these two horns are the bits that we're really interested in, because those are the bits that if any's been left behind, it's at the tip of those horns. Um, and so we just want to have a look at that and make sure everything.